Good morning, everyone. Good morning, teacher. Good morning, good morning. Excellent. Let's see how many we are. We're seven. We're missing half. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, what a nice. Okay, all right. So let us start with the the list. All right. So let's see, Mr. Jonathan. Present, present teacher. Thank you very much, Mr. Jonathan. Excellent, Miss Vania. I don't have Miss Vania no, yet. All right. Mr. Hugo. We don't have him just yet. Okay. Miss Dennis. Nope. Mr. Carlos Kevin. Hello. Excellent. Very well. Thank you very much. Mr. Carlos Martinez. Not yet. All right. Mr. Angel. A few people. Miss Jacqueline. Hi, teacher. Hello. Thank you very much. Miss Jimena. Hey, teacher. Thank you very much, Miss Jimena. Oh, hello, Miss Vania. It's okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. You're here. Miss Jasmine. Here, teacher. Thank you very much, Ms. Jasmine. Mr. Diego Alberto. Here, teacher. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right. Um, Ms. Arait. Here, teacher. Thank you very much, Ms. Arait. Ms. Lorena. Ms. Ms. Lorena. And she will probably join us in a few moments. Ms. Aura. Hi, teacher. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Very well. So we have Mr. Hugo. Here, teacher. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Ms. Dennis. Thank you very much. Excellent. Good morning. Uh, we're missing Miss Carlos Martinez. Yeah. And Mr. Angel. Yeah, we're missing Mr. Angel. And Miss Lorena. Oh, I can see Miss Lorena. Hmm. Well, we'll probably have some troubles. Me comenta Lorena que no puede abrir el no puede abrir su micrófono. Okay. Yeah, I just saw she locked down. It's okay. She can try again. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's see. There's here. All right. So let us start today's lesson. Welcome everyone. Very happy to be here with you. Today it's our week five. It's our fifth session. Today is Tuesday, 11th of October. We're almost in the middle of October. What's going on? Everything going on so fast. Our class, as you know, 12th teacher. Today's 12th. Uh, today's 12th. Thank you very much. See, even more October. Excellent. Thank you very much. I was um, I was typing it yesterday and I just looked up and I saw 11. So I was like, why not 11? So yeah, thank you very much. Oh, I don't know if that was how oh, it was mail. So today we're going to um, we're actually finishing up with the emotional basis biases. Sorry, 
Remember that we saw the motivational, the, the psychological, cognitive biases, all of those. And we had uh, homework, which was the emotional biases. I was looking at your homework yesterday. Most of you had it correctly. There were some little mistakes over there that we had, but overall it was pretty good. We're going to just talk about these ones. And we're going to keep going with negotiation. Uh, we're going to talk about cultural differences that affect negotiation, which was part of what you wrote in your uh, forum, which also I, I checked it and you had some very valid points. I give you that. We're going to see the components of culture. You're going to do a forum. It's, an act it's our activity today about the components of culture. And we're going to finish up with some tips for negotiating. Uh, if we hurry, I'm, I'm not sure if we, we will have um, or that much time, but maybe we can start with the financial terms. If not, we will leave the financial terms for next class. But uh, let us start with the homework. Remember that we were looking at the emotional biases last week, and um, we're talking about all the misperceptions as we have here all those things that you believe that may not actually be true okay uh, there are inconsistencies for example reversals what you're feeling what you do for example how you judge people how you judge things for example and we had three three misperceptions remember that a misperception is basically something that you think it's right or you think it's that way and that will probably not be it, okay? So we were looking at the homework, which was this one, and you had to categorize these ones over here in inaccuracy in terms of judging and reading emotions, uh, faculty beliefs, uh, faulty, sorry, faulty beliefs about the duration of emotional states, and faulty belief about the causal effects of emotion. The ones that you had um the most correct were these ones most of you had them correctly and these and these ones were a little bit mixed up so if you see in your feedback i didn't give you the correct answer because i just wanted to check with them check with you today those so just make sure that you change your answers so that you don't study from the wrong answers okay so in this first part OK, uh, when we're talking about judging and reading emotions, for example, which would be like one of those? Which would go on number one? What do you think? You can tell me which ones you put, so it's OK. It doesn't matter if they're wrong. So what would you put here? Number two, teacher. Number two, the impact of these emotions. This one's over here. Yes. Ah, no, 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 no. I know. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Okay. I. I put in number three, teacher. You put number three, letter C? Yes. Okay. No, wait, I, <laughs> I don't understand, teacher. Uh, are you told that, no, sorry, did you tell, did you tell that we have to put the letter A, B, C in All the right. chart? Don't worry, don't worry. It's a little bit, it got a little bit confusing. So let's do it backwards. For example, A. Let's do it the other way around. It's easier, I think. So most people assume that emotional states last longer than they actually do. So we have three parts. No judging and read and reading emotions, uh, duration of emotional states, faulty beliefs about causal effects. So A would go where? One, two or three? Mm, two. Mm, two. Ah, okay, yes, I think it's easier that way. Yeah, I, I confused you a little bit. I'm sorry. Yes, 
So in this case, we have oh, what a horrible A. Eh? Uh, this one. So emotional states actually don't last very long. If you ever go to therapy, which I believe is something that everyone should do once in their life at least. Um, so they will tell you that getting angry, as I told you in the last class, it only lasts five minutes. Everything else you just, we call it rumiando el enojo. You know, that's just it. If you are angry for days, you're not actually angry. You're just, you know, remembering things. But actually being angry only lasts five minutes. The same thing I used to, um, my, my psychologist, she used to tell me, you know, those people who have butterflies in their stomach, los que sienten maripositas en el estómago, when they're in love. Yeah, so that's, you know, that should happen just a few days and that's it. Love is not like that. So if you say, oh, I, I have, you know, butterflies in my stomach for six months, then there's something wrong with you because that doesn't happen. So, you know, emotions are fleeting. When we say fleeting, fleeting means eh, son pasajeras. Son, eh, terminan muy rápido. Emotions are fleeting. You know, they don't, they don't actually last that much. And they shouldn't last that much. So, you know, yes. There are faulty beliefs about that duration of emotional things, especially emotional states, anger, love, sadness as well. The same thing happens with um, with grief, con el duelo. It's okay to feel grief, but you know, there are people who feel grief for like three, four, five years. That's just denial. So, you know, emotions should be fleeting. They should not last that much, but anyway. Now, what about letter B? When we're talking about the impact, of these emotions as opposed to mood. Remember that mood is just how you feel. Okay, you know, like it's shorter, it's more fleeting than actually the emotion. Whereas mood refers to low intensity, diffuse effect to maybe that may be exogenous to the negotiation process and need not be directed toward a person. Emotion in negotiations implies intense feelings. It may arise from interacting with a counterpart during the negotiation process and be directed toward her or him. So you should keep it cool when you're in a negotiation. You should not let your emotions get the best of you. That's definitely a must. And in this case, there's one over here. Where would you put it? Judging, duration, or causes? Causes effects of the motion. Exactly. Very good. Yes. This one impacts in the causes. Yeah. Some people get hasty. Como que muy apurados. You know, they get they they get hasty, and that just causes it's yeah. called motion. Yes. Uh, there's no there's no secrets, right? It's just a practice or a, what? How can we control our emotions when we are doing an, a negotiation? Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of negotiation, negotiation. Hey, uh, how can we improve ourselves when we do this? The emotion things? Well, the yeah. part? Well, <laughs> I would definitely recommend therapy, but I mean, mind you, Therapy is not for crazy people. A lot of people think that, but um, therapy helps you a lot to, you know, channel your emotions and also to to um, to break patterns. I mean, it doesn't therapy is not just for people who are in love or, you know, stuff like that. They help you to to break your own patterns. Now, if you don't want to go to therapy, that's OK. Not everyone you know, not everyone believes in that, but maybe you could, uh, I don't know, like um, internalize your feeling, uh, try to think about, for example, when you get angry, what do you do? I'm going to give you a very, very simple example. You know, before, when I was younger, if I got angry, I would become very passive aggressive, you know? So I realized that, and generally that has a lot to do with, pa with parents. So what I didn't like from my mom, that's what I did. That saying, ese, ese dicho que dice lo que te choca, te checa. Well, 
believe me, it does happen. So that affected as well in that in negotiation. I used to work in sales for a long time. I, I worked in sales for a long time and I got frustrated and I got angry, you know, because I couldn't sell or because things didn't go the way I liked. And until I realized that I was becoming, you know, passive aggressive, that I became aggressive in my negotiation, in my negotiating, well, that's when I, you know, I just kind of calmed down. So my advice would be just to um, to check for the patterns that you have. Maybe check uh, if you, I don't know, if you get frustrated, if you get angry, what do you do when you get happy, for example? A lot of people, when they get happy, they do silly things. And silly, but I mean, I don't know, if you get a lot of money, you buy a car without thinking about it. I mean, those sort of things, you would need to really reflect about it. It takes a long time, yes, but it will help you in the end. And practice. You need to to have a lot of practice. If you don't have a, a job in sale, in you know, if you don't sell all the time, you can you know negotiate with people. It doesn't have to be just selling. So you know, that depends on each person, I guess. Okay. So uh, people must be aware about their, yeah. their behavior. No, it's I I think that it's uh, a a little bit co complicated because sometimes we are uh, how how can I say messius? We're stubborn. Stubborn. Yeah. I'm going to put here. Okay. I, yeah. It's stubborn. Okay. It's the more. Sometimes we are stubborn, yeah. um, and maybe uh, this aspect a uh, blind, yeah, blinds, blinds our our ourselves, and and it's difficult uh, to deal with people. Uh, well, in my in my case, I'm sometimes I'm stubborn when I try to Im improve uh, my behavior when I try to speak with people and I think I consider that it's important this aspect the, the behavior when you are doing a negotiation because well it's it the only way you no know, for example you are the when you are the the person who do the negotiation you you really have to be in, um, you really have to be in, oh. you 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 have to be confident teacher you have to be confident you know in yourself and you have to to understand that you are in a treat also so you are you are not only talking with with a person and and I'm talking about a, a minor thing you are really doing an important thing and you have to be confident about sometimes i think that the nervous or or your behavior or your emotions betrayed you and so for that i consider that uh, most of people when will do these kind of things uh, have have to know their selves no uh, and as you said and as you said teacher and as you said you you really reflect, reflect, reflect. Yeah. Reflect. yeah. Yes, but but um, we have to be uh, truly, seamos sinceros. We have to be truly. Uh, uh, no one, no one is going to teach you that things you you uh, along the time you will uh, treat. Vas a saber tratar. You will treat. Uh, know you? I consider that teacher, but uh, no, it's true. I mean, you are you are completely correct. No one is going to tell you <laughs> what you're going to do or how you're going to um, not to improve, but uh, what you need. I mean, it takes a long time and it takes a lot of personal work. I will tell you that, yeah. I mean, I'm not the really. I mean, I'm not the greatest person. I'm not the most calm person. Ask my boyfriend. But um, you know, yeah, it takes a long time. But you do need to to know yourself, and it's good. At least I believe I'm a very, very true believer 
of uh, emotional intelligence. If you don't have emotional intelligence, for me, that's my opinion. If you don't have emotional intelligence, then there are going to be a lot of things that you will not be able to do. And you will not be a good leader, for example. Well, yeah. Also, a lot of people um, like I kind of block her uh, her sentiment, like their feelings, no? The a lot of what? Uh, some some people uh, block uh, block their feelings. Yes, block their feelings. It's block. Oh, block. Yes, yes, that is true. And this is like another way to in the job yeah that's that's true yeah and especially because we live in a society where you know like appearances matter in this society and you should always look strong and you should always look you know like tall and strong and not weak but The truth is, we are humans, and humans are made to err. Estamos hechos para equivocarnos. That's the truth. The thing is that you need to learn. You know, I, I have a friend. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell. They, well, she's an ex-friend. But uh, the reason why she's an ex-friend is because she, you know, apart that she lied about everything, she just didn't learn about her mistakes. And it's okay to say, you know what? I don't want that in my life. I don't want someone who doesn't learn and who just drags me through the mud. Que me lleva entre las patas. No. Why Why should we be sad? Why should we be angry all the time? We should be happy as much as you wish. And blocking emotions, you know, that happens a lot. And that can affect you also at work. I mean, and believe me, I'm sure you already know a lot of people you work with and you say, oh my God. If you were in my boss, I mean, I would never talk to you. I mean, a lot of people who don't know how to be leaders, a lot of people who don't know how to manage a negotiation because the emotions get the best of them, for example. And I'm going to give you a very, very simple example. So I, I have a friend and her, her boss, she went to these coaching things. I, I don't know if anyone went to coaching and if you believe in coaching, that's good. I don't be, I personally don't believe in coaching, but her boss went to coaching and she feels like a coach. And, you know, once a woman, she was very frustrated. Yeah, I mean, I, there was a woman who was very frustrated and she, I don't know, she started like yelling, you know, shouting to everyone. And <laughs> and um, the boss, she got like very, very offensed. You know, she was like, oh, my God, you shouldn't talk to me like that. And my friends was like, well, I'm not offended. And I'm, I can see that she's frustrated. And maybe that's the way she deals with it. Why should I be offended? It's not against me. And the boss was like super angry. And we were all like, emotional intelligence, for example. Okay. Yes, toxic people, <laughs> negative people. There are all kinds of people in this world. But, you know. So, yeah, I'm a true believer of emotional intelligence. I'm not trying to, no way evangelizar a nadie, that's not my job. But you should know your emotions so that they don't get better, the better part of you. Okay? And that, let's go back a little bit, um, and that's exactly that, the causal effect of emotion. So you need to know yourself. You need to know as well a little bit the other person or the other party so that you can understand, I know you're frustrated. I'm not going to take it personal. It lets, you know, personal is another way business is here. So, you know, so that you can, um, you don't have bad results in that case, for example. And as we said, let's go back here. Uh, humans are made to err. Estamos hechos para equivocarnos, para errar. So people often err in assessing what they are feeling. That's what we're saying. You don't really know if you're angry or in my case, if I'm hungry. So, because if I'm hungry, I'm angry. So people often err in assessing what they are feeling, which leads to errors in predicting their subsequent behavior. Yes, it does happen. There are people who are sad and they get angry. 
and that's normal. That's a lot normal. Grief does a lot of things to people, but you don't really know how that people is going to behave. Obviously, predictability is low, so you don't really know what you're going to expect. Es cuando decimos que la gente es muy voluble. I'm like, don't say anything to him or her because you don't know how he or her is going to react. Okay. So in this case, people often err. Where would you put it? Judging and reading, duration or, or causal effect. Where would you put that? You cannot predict the subsequent behavior. would you put it? One, two, or three? Okay. One teacher. One, judging and reading emotions. Well, it could be a good one in number one. At the end, you are teacher. judging and reading. And which is three. three. Ah. Sorry, teacher. No, it's okay. It's okay. Yes, exactly. In this case, we're talking about number three, the causal effects. So if you cannot predict, most of the times you won't, if you cannot predict what the other person is feeling, and if you definitely don't know what you're feeling, then you're going to have problems. You will not know what's going to happen next, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, when people are overconfident in their ability to predict others' emotion, it's like when they tell you, oh, why are you angry? I'm not angry. Oh no, you look angry. I'm sure you're angry. Think about your, think about it. Look into yourself. I'm not angry, I'm hungry, for example, okay? So in this case, where would you put it? One, two, or three? What do you think? People are overconfident in reading other people's emotions. One, two, three. Where do you think is a good place for this one? Number one. Number one, exactly. Yes. This one is made for number one. You have inaccuracy. You're not accurate. You're not correct in judging and reading emotions. It's like when people tell you, I'm very good at reading people. Sure. Yeah. Well, maybe you are, maybe you're not, but I don't believe people should say that. Now, what about letter E? Negotiators often fall prey to the illusion of transparency, such that they believe that others can read their emotions. Where would you put that? One, two, or three? Uh, number one. Very good. It's number one. So the illusion of transparency is like, I don't know, maybe you're nervous and you say, okay, so people are going to know, people are going to know that I'm nervous, for example, that other people is going to be able to read what you feel. Okay. We should all have a poker face once in a while. Now, what about letter F? People often mispredict why others feel the way they do and the intensity of their feelings. Where would you put that? Number three. Yeah, 
The ring. No. Ah, no, sorry. Number one. Bueno, yo le puse ahí. Yes, very good. Excellent. Yes. This one is number one. As we said, not a lot of people will be able to know what's wrong with you. There are people who can read very well other people, and that's good. But not everyone. Not everyone is going to know what's going on in your head. Okay, so they're not telepaths. You, unless you have like a very, very, you know, strong facial expression, you know, they will not know what's going on through your head, for example. Okay, so um, also they will not know the intensity. Maybe you're happy, but not that happy. You know, it's just a matter of whether you're, um, you know, you're portraying your emotions. Uh, what about letter G? The emotional effects of extremely positive or negative events do not last nearly so long as negotiators might think. Where would you put that? Number two. Number two, yes. It's the duration. Yes, we have it over here. You heard a story on the radio where the moral was not to make decision in moments of much anger or sadness because you may regret it later. You must calm down first. This can be applied to business. Yes, this should be applied <laughs> to business. That is true. And they tell you that don't make rash decisions when you're happy or when you're angry. That's why a lot of marriages end up in divorce. Love is fleeting. Happiness is fleeting. You should not make rash decisions. You're completely correct. Yeah, that should be applied on business. You know that saying of it's business, not pleasure. It's business. Separate personal things from from pleasure from business and that's exactly what we're going to see it's a very good example thank you very much yes that should be applied it's not always applied um now what about letter h people do not adequately account for the ability of their psychological immune system to adapt you don't really feel like you will be able to adapt to maybe a, a, a new atmosphere for example or in a negotiation, you will not be able to carry out the, the negotiation, for example. Okay, there are some people who just feel like, no, I won't be able to do it. Okay, so where would you put that duration or causal effects? What do you think? Number three and the causal effects. Okay, so yes, it could mean or it could tell us that that could be a cause. Um, however, if you look at the other one, most negotiators believe that emotions predict behavior. If we're predicting behavior, this one is better on. So this one is better here. And this one, the accountability of the psychological immune system to adapt would be the duration of the emotion. Can you adapt to new situations? There are a lot of people you, that um, the emotions get the best of them. And as they say, fear paralyzes them. There are a lot of people who, you know, they feel something and that's it. They don't move. That's incredible. Fear paralyzes. That is true. And I'm sure you've had it in, I don't know, maybe once in your life. Mm -hmm. Oh, present. <laughs> oh my God. All right. 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we should all get shots. All right, near well. So, do we have any questions or doubt about the emotional biases? So uh, you have them over here, then it's the same thing. Now let us go in today with what cultural differences affect negotiation. What we saw or we already saw, uh, what happens inside of each, pe of each person that is going to affect how they think, how they feel, for example, the motivation that they can get from outside or from inside, okay, from themselves, we've seen all those biases, what makes them make a decision, what makes them behave in a way. Now let us see what happens um, when it comes to, yes, oh, then, Mr. Jonathan, you're taking the class away. <laughs> Very good, yes. We're actually going to see about that. Racism can affect, excellent. Another thing, what other cultural difference can affect negotiation? Sexism, definitely, yes. Uh, maybe also like uh, Indian culture because it's like, well, not Indian, specifically. The Occidental, but the Oriental culture, I kind of really is different. Mm -hmm. Very good, that's true. And we're going, we have an example on that. Very nice, excellent. Also, uh, not it's not cultural, but uh, the time zone affects a uh, lot the negotiation. Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. The uh, uh, headset. Mhm. Mm the, <laughs> the headache. Yeah. The yeah. If you've ever been jet lagged, uh, yeah, that's horrible. Okay. Very good. Another cultural difference that we might have. Uh, it could be beliefs. Definitely, beliefs. Mm -hmm. Try to argue with uh, someone very religious. I dare you. Mm -hmm. Another thing. Have you ever heard? I didn't know. I, I just heard that term, I, I think yesterday. I don't remember what I was reading. I don't even remember the term, but um, it was. Planeta, no sé qué. I don't remember. It was a term. We were reading it. I was with my boyfriend and, she, and I was like, what is that? And he looked at me and he was like, people who think the earth is flat. Las personas que creen que la tierra es plana. And I was like, what? And I was like, yeah, there are people who believe that. Imagine trying to convince that person that the earth is not flat. I mean, science is there. But I don't know, they believe it for some reason. So imagine having to deal with someone like that. Or if you are, you know, anti-vaccination, -vaccina try to do to argue with that, for example. I don't know. There are people who believe a lot of things. And that's culture at the end. Religion. Exactly. Arabian and Jews can't do business together. <laughs> that is true. Oh, I have a lot of good stories from Jews and, Ar and Arabic people. Not, you know, not racist stories. I actually know Jews and, and Arabic people. And they, uh, yeah, they don't mix. Okay, very good. Any other cultural difference? For example, um, what about um, aesthetics? Like... Uh, what you believe is pretty, you know, or some, uh, that something is pretty, or what you believe something is ugly. Do you think that could affect? Yes, teacher, for example, there are uh, companies that they say, it doesn't matter what is your uh, sex orientation, your um, um, uh, skin color, Mm -hmm. um, etc. Et 
But if you uh, visit their websites, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, some pharmaceutics or pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. uh, you you can see a, a young woman, blonde hair, and so I I think they are um, contradiciéndose. Yeah, they're um. Oh, I forgot the word. Well, yeah, they're going backwards. Yeah, they're opposing themselves. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's right. I, I don't remember which brand was it. I saw it yesterday on Instagram or like two days ago. And they have a photograph. I don't know if it was Louis Vuitton or I have no idea what brand it was. It's just an, an ad. But there was a, a picture of a woman and it was a very close up photograph. And the woman, you know, she had a little bit of mustache. She had, you know, facial hair, which is normal. We all have it, you know. And she had makeup on and everything. But it was like, you know, all of the photographs were like that. They were trying to portray that women, we are not perfect. We're definitely not perfect. So, and the skin is not perfect. And, you know, facial hair is normal. We all have it. So I was thinking, you know, like, oh, that's. You know, that's a good strategy to allure, para atraer, you know, to allure people. But as you say, Mr. Jonathan, they, you know, give these ads and then you go to the clothes and la talla 30 es como el 23, no? So what's going on? Yeah, exactly. Very good. So as you say, yes, there are many, many cultural differences that are going to affect negotiation. And if you want to be a good negotiator, you need to take into account these differences. I told you the, the example of um, the Indian wedding my, my sister had. Well, not she didn't marry, no, but she had a girl who she was having an Indian wedding. That's a cultural difference. For us Mexicans, it's not like that. Over there, it's a big deal. It's a two-week deal, you know, for example. So in this case, we're going to start exactly with that. Let us start with social judgments are likely to diverge across cultures. We do not have the same uh, thoughts. We do not have the same culture. We do not have the same education. We're not same. We're not the same people. And what we believe, it's okay. It can change not only around us. Imagine having to deal with people all around the world. It's a lot. So culture has an influence in negotiation. That is true. And we must consider some things, okay? Um, the knowledge structures negotiators have internalized from their cultural socialization, or in other words, which knowledge structures have become available in a particular culture. That's why I love languages so much because learning a language is not just learning the grammar or the vocabulary you learn about the culture you literally learn you know how people behave in other countries at least that's my perspective that's why i love languages because um you know i was studying french when i was a kid and i learned a lot about the culture and then that made me meet people you know actually french people and i was like oh that's right you know for example and you know it's not just cultures you don't have to learn a language just to know the culture but it helps for example okay and in this case yeah you definitely need to have it yes mr jonathan uh, i think there is a neutral way to to negotiate with with people around the world, mm -hmm. uh, but I I was thinking, for example, if the majority um, of the people you are going to to, neg to negotiate are from another culture, it can affect uh, negatively. Uh, for example, if you are uh, doing business with uh, Asian people. Uh, maybe um, instead of the room uh, where you normally or where you come on uh, get inside and you sit down on chairs, maybe in, in that case they are sitting on the floor and you you are not um, 
accustomed accustomed yes accustomed or or the, by the other hand um, maybe the the majority are occidental people and maybe they are drinking a uh, coke or pepsi and the other people they uh, don't drink those um, so those products uh, i i think you uh, uh, well, uh, people doing business have to take account all of uh, that those aspects mm -hmm. to to be successful. Yeah. In the in in uh, where when you are uh, doing business. Mm -hmm. That is true, and as you said, knowledge is key. Yes, you would need. To, to to have the knowledge who you are dealing with. That's right. If they, for example, we don't take off the shoes. Asian people do, as you, as you mentioned. Teacher, so. Also the greetings, for example, when you shake your hands or when you kiss the, the, in the on the face or, or, or making a bow, a bow, a bow. Bow, yeah, bowing. Yes, exactly. Very good. That's excellent. We don't bow. Imagine having to bow. Imagine having to meet the queen and you just go like, I don't know how to curtsy. You know. Yeah, very good. Excellent. That is true. Knowledge. Knowledge is key, people. Yes, definitely. And that's exactly what we're going to see. See, I told you Mr. Jonathan is looking at the it has the whole class figured out. <laughs> very good. Um, we're talking about knowledge structures. Definitely, we must know who we are negotiating with. So, knowledge structure have high accessibility as a result of frequent use. Um, it is a direct reflection of their predominance in cultural institutions, public disclosure, social structures, and the like. It's basically what you learn. Okay, you can learn it at school. You can learn it by watching the the news. You can learn it by reading the paper or reading new, uh, you know, articles, for example, okay? However, there are some knowledge structures that are actually triggered, because on detonadas, that are actually triggered or activated at the negotiation table, which is a function of the properties of the negotiator, the conflict itself, and the feature of the social context. Now, this is where we talk about knowledge, okay? What we mean about knowledge is uh, the construct availability, the construct accessibility, and we're going to see this one, and the construct activation. All these three, they talk about knowledge, okay? The first one, when we're talking about construct availability, okay, when a negotiation bias is stronger and more among North Americans than among members of other cultural groups, this is just like a little example, it may reflect that the relevant knowledge structure is not cognitively available to members to, of the other group. So cultural differences arise because a central construct in one culture has no meaning equivalent in another country. Bowing is an example. If someone does this to me, I just go like, eh? what? What does that mean? And for Asian people, you know, that's a sign of respect, for example. OK, so for me, the fact that someone bows at me, it doesn't trigger anything in me because I'm not used to that. Culturally, we do not bow. So it means nothing to us. However, if you know that you are dealing with Asian people, if you see someone bowing, then you should bow back, for example. OK, that means that it's going to trigger, it's going to activate a knowledge. However, because in your country, or because our culture doesn't have that, it doesn't do anything in our in our knowledge. We just go like, okay, fine, if you want to do that. Okay. Um, however, we should not assume that differences in construct availability are the primary source of cultural differences, because you can learn it. If you're going to deal with someone from another country, then learn about their their culture that will give you the power that will give you the knowledge to be able you know to be in a in a very stable and equivalent negotiating negotiation for example 
OK, so the availability is basically that. Sometimes some things are not going to trigger anything in us because it's not in our culture. Eh, good, thank you very much. OK, but it's I mean, it doesn't mean that um, you cannot you cannot not learn it. You must not put double negatives, but you cannot not learn it, for example. That's contract availability. That is not available. However, we pass into construct accessibility. What that means is that that knowledge is buried in your mind. And here we see a little bit of pedagogy. So you have two uh, accessibility dynamics, the temporary accessibility and the chronic accessibility. What we mean with this is that maybe the knowledge is going to be deeply buried in your memory or it's going to be on top of the stack, which means it's right there. You know, it's right there in your mind. Or maybe it's something that you learned a long time ago, but it's there. It's there in your mind. Mm -hmm. However, this is something that you must take into consideration because Temporary accessibility means that the knowledge structure has received stimulation from a recent experience and has, han, hence has become more likely than otherwise to be activated. The knowledge is there, okay? The chronic accessibility, it occurs when both constructs are available cross-culturally, yet the fact that culture differs indicates that one con construct is going to be higher in accessibility for another party and the other, other concept is chronically higher for another. The bowing is the example. I'm going to learn it and I'm going to keep it very well in my mind. But maybe if I see someone bowing, I'm going to be like, oh, right, that means respect, for example. Yes, I have it there, but it's not going to be on top of the stack like for the other person. Now, remember that when you learn something, uh, there are two ways of learning, and we all know this. You know, one way is how you learn, you know, for an exam and, you know, very quickly for a test, for the class or anything like that. But try to remember it a month later. If you do not remember it, then you did not learn it. And that's true, okay? If you do not remember what you learn, for example, in a subject, then you did not learn well. If, however, something triggers your mind and then you remember that information, it's not that you did not learn it well, you actually learned it well, but our brain is designed that way. You have like, you know, a small part of your brain that is going to keep all your information. And once, you know, if there's something that is going to trigger it, it's going to tell you, oh, wait, I have the information, here it is. And the brain is going to give it. That means you learned well. If you do not remember it at all. It's like, for example, when I ask my students, do you remember that in our first level we, uh, I don't know, we studied um, this topic? And they'll go like, no, I am triggering it, but they're not remembering it. So that means that they, not, they did not learn it. Yes, exactly. Very good. Yes, that is true. Even though you might forget it, if you learned it well, someday, somehow, you will remember it. How I don't know how, but something will trigger it. That means you learned well. And you can ask any teacher. That means you learned well. If you never remember it, then you never learned it. Nunca lo aprendieron en el primer lugar. So, you know, that's knowledge. Now, in this case, it could be... Uh, in, when it comes to temporary, is because you're receiving stimulation because of recent experience. If I'm looking at people bowing all the time, and I'm going to remember it very easily. The chronic accessibility, if I have it in the back of my mind, I learned it well. Maybe I will have trouble remembering it, but I have it. I learned it. Okay, so those are the two differences of the knowledge. If you're going to have a negotiation with someone, then make sure that you have both. You actually learned it, and because of, repeti of repetition, you're going to use it very, very, um, or you're going to usually use it in this case. OK. 
Okay, so that's the construct accessibility. How accessible is your knowledge? Okay, how very well do you have your knowledge over there? Did you learn it well? Is it knowledge that you can access easily and rapidly, for example? And also, you have the construct activation. Yes, Mr. Carlos, tell me. What was the, uh, the meaning of deeply buried? Uh, yes, uh, deeply buried. Oh, deeply buried is um, ah, enterrado profundamente. Deeply buried. Okay, okay. You're welcome. And then you have construct and activation. Uh, we refer to the factors present at the bargaining table. Remember that the bargaining table is the negotiation. Okay. These are the factors present at the bargaining table that determine whether or not culturally shared knowledge structures are likely to exert an influence on negotiation. If I don't know, the other party doesn't mind that I don't really know how to bow. Eh, it's okay. These factors include the perceiver's social context, property of the social stimulus or negotiating task, and properties of the individual perceiver negotiator. That depends on the person. You cannot really tell this one. There are people who, you know, take manners a lot into consideration. There are relaxed people, laid back people, you know, so doesn't uh, you cannot predict this one as it says it activates according to the context so you would have to wait and see in your negotiating mm -hmm. these are construct availability construct accessibility and construct activation okay do we have questions about this one So remember, knowledge is key. I used to um, I, I used to have a boss, and she would always tell me, um, "No importa que digas tonterías, mientras las digas con seguridad, todo el mundo te va a creer." So I was like, "Oh, it did uh, work a lot of times, at least at the beginning when I didn't know a lot about selling." So, oh, excellent. Maybe you could use that, but all also. Make sure you know what you're negotiating. Tener el conocimiento es, es, es el poder, es la llave. Sepan qué están tratando de obtener o qué venden o, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen those people who try to sell you things and they don't really know what they're selling. It's like, oh, okay. So maybe that's not such a good idea. Now, the social context of negotiation had been largely ignored in negotiating theory for several decades. So everyone's, everyone was like, OK, so what happens around you, it's not really important. However, um, there was a cognitive and motivational paradigm in the field, and that's what spurred them on. Eso fue lo que, como que los llevó a la luz, OK, the social context. This is from Kramer and Messick, 1995, OK? And that's exactly what we're going to go now, to the social context, OK? Culture creates the social context and we have our um, levels in this case we're going to see what type of levels we have in social context now each level affects a specific group of people and we have three the dyadic level this is the relationship between two individuals so one person and another person that's the dyadic level the group level, it's among members within and between groups. OK, so five people from this group and five people from that group and how we interact. OK, and the network level, it's the web of extended relationships among negotiating parties. Oh, that's my computer. Uh, extended relationships. So this group of people know this other group of people and this group of people know these two other groups of people. And these two know this one, you know, that's the web. It's la telaraña, it's la red, okay, of people who uh, get to know each other. El mundo es una servilleta, créanme. Yes. Everyone knows everyone. How? I don't know how. But it happens. Now, let's talk a little bit about this one. The diadic, the group level, and the network level. 
It's very self-explanatory, to tell you the truth. However, it is important that we look at it, okay? As we said, the dyadic level is the relationship between two individual negotiators, okay? Now, a uh, difference or something that is very important about these two individual negotiators is whether the other party is an in-group or out-group member. Such distinctions have importance for the development of cooperation and trust and have a dramatic effect on negotiating behavior. That's why we don't trust strange people. We shouldn't, but you know, that happens a lot as well. Cultures, individuals make distinction between those with whom they have close relations and those with whom they have no relation commitment. If you're going to have a negotiating or a negotiation with your best friend, is it going to be the same negotiation as if someone you don't know? What do you think? your negotiation with your friend, with your best friend, and a negotiation with Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. If you're going to, to have a negotiation with your best friend, and you're going to have another negotiation with someone you don't know, a complete stranger, do you think they're going to be the same type of negotiations? No, it doesn't. No, did you? Yeah. I, I think that it's different. Uh, maybe because you know, when if, if we're talking about our best friend maybe if you how can i say see see today has a claras if you left clear oh, if you make clear or you make um or, yeah you clar clarify i'm sorry so lucky. you clarify Okay, if you clarify uh, that business are business, uh, for example, the you know no, the, uh, don't uh, don't confuse the the friendship with business. Yes, I think I think that you have to be uh, straight, straight. Yeah, strict. Yeah, uh, because sometimes uh, your friends it's going to approach the situation and that uh, your friends maybe well it's a, it's a pain teacher i think that it's a pain uh, of you because okay it's different if you do a negotiation uh, among your friend or a strange if it's a strange a strange a strange person it would be more serious the question i i get i think no yes mm -hmm. that yeah. is Nature. Yes, definitely. They are different. At the end, we are human beings and we long for relationships. We cannot live without relationships. That's us. We are made to interact with other people. So that's true. We should take into consideration all these factors. That is true. We cannot. Um, it's very hard for us to separate, you know, if you have a good relationship with someone and then you have, you know, just a normal type of relationship, you know, a respectful relationship, they're not going to be the same, unfortunately, and it's hard to do that. Now, as you can see here, research in the United States has illustrated that negotiating, negotiations among strangers achieve higher gain at the negotiation table than close friends. Why? Because negotiators within in-groups, that means that you have close relationships, uh, focus extensively on preserving the relationship. So if I'm going to negotiate with my best friend, I am I want to keep him or her as my best friend. So I will try not to be so aggressive, for example. You can facilitate your friend's payments. Yes, not to a stranger, that is true. Uh, you can be shiny to ask him for, oh, okay, you cannot be shy to ask him for to pay his doubts. That's good. And with a stranger, not yet. Exactly. That is true. There, You make uh, concessions, we say. You tend to make concessions and you try to preserve the relationship. Yeah. Don't mix business and pleasure. 
that is true. Um, that means that it inhibits you from focusing on the task. Yeah, that's normal. We are human beings. Okay. So, any questions here? Any comments? Okay. No teacher or clear. Very, very good. No questions. Excellent. All right. Um, now, the meaning of in-groups and out-groups within American society can be quite different than those in other cultural contexts. Uh, this is just an example. The individualistic cultures, such as the United States, there is high mobility and people are able to join and leave groups with great frequency. As a result, individuals are more adept and open to forming relations with out-group members. Behavior with out-group members is expected to be indifferent, competitive, or even hostile. We live, as Mexicans, we live in a society where it is very common to stay close to the place you were born, to the place where you lived with your family. Uh, just notice the um, universities, for example. Generally, well, not generally, most of the time here in Mexico, we go to university close to home. We just go, you know, to school and then we go back home. And in, an, in some other countries, for example, Europe, for example, United States, children go even to, an, to other countries or to other cities to study. That's what happens, for example, in Europe, because they are part of the, um, of the European community. So a kid from Spain can go study university in Italy. And that's normal. In France, you know, children, or not children, young adults at 18, they're like, the parents are like, okay, go, bye-bye. Uh, in small stores of the corner, they notice clients and confuse friendship with business. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely they have. They have um, the good business mind, you know, yeah, and that's true. You know, making concessions is it's not normal. And I don't know if you've heard that that if your close friend has like a business, then ask for free, help your friend, you know, pay what is due. It's ridiculous to ask things for free. But anyway, people are entitled to their opinion. So in this case, um, yeah, we stay close to home, generally. And um, not a lot of societies do that. People go out, people go to other countries. So, you know, being the new kid, being the new person in the community, it's normal for them because they're accustomed to that. We are not that much. I mean, there are people who do, but we're not that accustomed. Mexico is a very family unit society. We stay close to family and that's okay, but it also has its disadvantages at the end. Um, however, it's like the other part of the coin. In collectivist, collectivist cultures, individuals are born into cohesive, cohesive, sorry, cohesive in-groups and mobility tends to be low. Mexico is one of them. Uh, resulting in stronger and more durable ties to one's in-groups, while at the same time resulting in weaker and more distant ties to out-group members. In this culture, social interactions with in-group members is expected to be cooperative okay and that's true here in mexico we have that i'm going to give you a very very simple example my father always tells me you should not uh charge you know or like do business with family if they ask you for something it's free and i was like what no it might be family but not everyone is considered family to me so that's what happens here in mexico we must learn sometimes to break that and sometimes it is good. So this is the dietic level. That relationship that you have between people and people, you know, two people in the new that's it. Mm -hmm. Yes, comments over there? No, no questions, no doubts, no comments. Okay. 
Now let us go to group level. So group level is very self-explanatory. The interactions among members oh, no. within and between groups. Yes, over there, I heard you. No. no, no questions, no doubts. Um, so as we know, negotiations often take place between groups who rely on the dyadic level because they're individual agents to represent their interest and to conduct transactions that have banks. Oh, hey, perdón, hermano, Carlos, tenemos tu micrófono. Let me just... I told him. Um, who rely on individual agents to represent their interest and to conduct transactions that affect the group's welfare. Within each organization, there are groups of people or constituents who interact with each other. Obviously. Negotiation teams also add much complexity to the negotiations. These dynamics include, for example, the nature, the nature of within group conflict and the degree of coordination that occurs among group members. If you don't have a strong group, I mean, if you're going to do a negotiate, generally negotiations are based in groups. If it's, you know, one on one, that's different. But big negotiations, generally they have groups. So make sure you have a good group. Make sure you work together and make sure you work in team together, you know, very well. Because if you do not have a good relationship with the group, eh, your negotiation is not going to last. Okay, so be careful there. I know family that does business together and work together. Yes, that's true. And everything goes excellent. But they can fight and have trouble with the sons and the wives and husbands and all family members by badness. That's true. There are people who stop talking to each other because of businesses. Um, emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence. Um, that's true, that's definitely true. Now, for example, culture is likely to affect the way in which internal conflict is dealt with and manifested with the negotiation team. We need to know how to work around the problems. And they say that everything is learned from family. You know, most people say that um, children learn at school. Uh -uh. No, they learn from family. You can teach them whatever you wish at school. But if they do not have, a, you know, a good and I don't mean this in a bad way, but a good education, you know, with values and morals and principles at home. School is not going to do anything. School is just a, you know, a way of fun. That's good. That's going to be school. So obviously the type of culture that you will have is going to affect. You can go to the best school ever. You can go to any type of school, but if you do not have a good base, eh, you're still going to be the same person at the end. And obviously, it's going to manifest when you work. Okay, remember that negotiations don't just mean, you know, with another company or with another person. It even means how you treat other people, how you work together, how you work as a team. That's negotiations at the end of the day. Um, this is the group level. And then the network level, as the name says, is the web. It's the web of extended relationships among negotiation parties. Last, we consider how culture affects social networks among negotiators. A marriage is negotiation. <laughs> yeah, that is true. I have a friend, she, uh, she got married very young. She got married when she was like, I don't know, 24, 25, something like that. And a few years later, she would always tell us um, if we would ask her how her marriage was doing, she would always tell us chantaje. De eso se trata el matrimonio, chantaje. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> wow. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> marriage is negotiation. That's true. Mm, yeah, a any type of relationship is negotiation. Yeah. Traten de decidir quién lava los trastes y quién hace el que hace. Yeah. Mm. I dare you. So, yeah. <laughs> so,
So we consider how culture affects social networks among negotiators and how this can affect negotiations in different cultures. We consider ethic uh, comparisons across social network characteristics and how cross-cultural differences in such characteristics create cultural differences in trust, cooperation, and cooperation, obviously. You need to... Um, knowledge. Knowledge is key at the end. I keep repeating this, but it's true. Yes, students and teachers negotiate activities and homework. See, we have negotiation everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Make sure you have your good tips. At the end, I, I found some good tips for negotiating. I'm going to give them to you. All right, so thank you very much. Do we have any questions with the dyadic, the group, or the network level? These are the type of relationships, remember? Teacher, teacher, do you do you consider that uh, human race? Well, something something that human race have is the negotiation. Do you think that it's an intrinsic thing, intrinsic thing that we have as human race? Yes, definitely. We don't settle, and we shouldn't settle. No, we shouldn't settle. But as humans, we are made to negotiate. Yes. And, and you think that all life, uh, uh, when we when we are growing up, or when we grow up, uh, okay, in in all in all moment of our life, we do the negotiation uh, since we are kids. Uh, uh, how can I say hasta toward? Te diría toward or until or, or since? Until. Hasta is until. 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 Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Until. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Until. Until we are a mature people, we always negotiate. We. I think we are taught. Que nos enseñan. I think we are taught, and we obviously we repeat it or we mimic it. We don't repeat it. We mimic when we are children. I think we do do it. I'm going to give you a very, very simple example. Uh, there is a kid in my sister's, uh, she lives in, you know, in an apartment building. And there was a couple who had a, a, a young child. You know, she, he was a baby, literally. I mean, he was a toddler. He was like one, two, no, he was like two, three years old because he could already articulate, you know? So it was Halloween and they put him on a, you know, on a costume. I, I don't remember what type of costume, but it involved a mask. It had a mask. So they dressed him up, you know, and they were leaving the building and the kid was crying and crying and crying because he didn't want to wear the mask. So what the mother did, you know, she got down on his own, you know, at the same level as the kid and he was like, okay, why are you crying? And he was like, I don't want to wear the mask. You know, it's sweaty, it's hot and everything. And she was like, OK, I'll tell you what. So don't wear the mask. And when they take the picture, just put the mask 10 seconds and then you can take it off. What do you say? And the kid was like, OK. He stopped crying, you know. So that's a type of negotiation at the end. And the kid is going to learn that, you know, he can bargain with things. He can negotiate with things. He doesn't have to do a tantrum. He doesn't have to scream. He doesn't have to fight. No, he can negotiate anything he can negotiate. OK, so I'm going to give you this. And what do you what do you say if you do that, for example? And it was a very simple thing that the mother did at the end. But the kid is going to learn that. There are some people who you know, they don't get what they want and they want to fight. Stop, wait, take a breath, you know, let's speak like normal people. Let's do that. So, yes, I do believe that um, we negotiate since we are, you know, small children, but we mimic. Remember, a child mimics. A child does not. I mean, there are some things that a kid is going to do on their own because it's his nature or her nature. 
but most of the time the child is mimicking he's not just no for Espíritu santo no he's mimicking okay so yeah i do think we negotiate if we are taught si nos enseñan yes we, i do think we do so do you consider that negotiation is a skill that all people can develop or 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 not all people can negotiate for you mm, i think people everyone can negotiate not in the you know win-win way i think that's different not everyone has like um, that vision of okay so i'm going to have 50 and you're going to have 50 or i'm going to get this and you're going to get that it's going to be a win-win no there are people who are like more aggressive for example that depends on their style really and depends on the context of course but um i do believe that everyone can negotiate everyone absolutely everyone not ju just not in the same way no on each person okay sure thanks yeah you're welcome any other question any other doubt any other comment i like comments okay yeah look at your day to day you're going to notice a lot of things i like staring at people i mean not staring i like observing people you can sit me on a bench in the park and i will stay for hours looking at people that's my well that was my fun because pandemic but um yeah I, I love watching people how they uh, how they behave and because i was i worked for a long long time in sales so i tend i tend to to watch people maybe i'm not such a good reader of people but i like to watch them and see what they do so try to do that in your day to day Look at your family, look at your friends, look how they negotiate. And maybe you will start noticing small things. At least that's what I did. I started uh, noticing small things on people. And I was like, oh, okay, so maybe I should not do that. Oh, maybe I should do that, for example. Mm -hmm, yeah, I had um, a boss, uh, one of my bosses, she was very, very good at sales. She was, uh, she studied marketing. But she was excellent at sales, excellent, excellent. And um, I remember that every time we went to, this is, you know, just an example, but, and you don't have to do that all the time, but every time she, I used to work at weddings because I need to give you a context. So I used to work, you know, in the wedding thing. So um, every time I met with a bride or with the bride and the groom, la novia el novio, um, I used to do some things. I'm going to give you an example of those. So if we would meet at the Starbucks, let's just say that. If we had to meet at a Starbucks, I would arrive uh, an hour before my date or at least half an hour before my my appointment just to check the place. I'm going to tell you why. So I would walk around the Starbucks because it was different Starbucks. No? I would walk around the Starbucks and I would choose the best uh, place because I needed to be seated against a wall. Siempre me tenía que sentar hacia una pared. Because that way they would not get distracted from me. If I would be seated, you know, where people were passing by, then they get distracted and they don't listen. And it's normal. People do that. It's normal. So I would, you know, I would go to the place half an hour, an hour before, and I would check the place out and I would choose my seat. I had to to look for good lighting, obviously, if it was late at night or somewhere with good light, normal, you know, like solar, you know, like normal light, sunlight and um, against a wall. I would sit against a wall. And then uh, generally I like to to sit near a window because then I would see when they would you know, when they arrived. So I would be like, you know, getting ready, you know, like putting everything in order, take the iPad out, you know, stuff like that. And then when they arrived, I would already have a drink for me. But the moment they arrived, I would tell them, okay, so what are you drinking? Oh, a chai latte. Okay, I will get them for you. So I would invite them the first drink, 
just the first drink, not all of them. But the first one I would invite, the, the first drink. And then I would always, um, in weddings, this is just because of the context, in the wedding, in wedding section, in wedding culture, I would always start with the question, so tell me, how did you two meet? So for the first half an hour, 40 minutes probably, the only thing I listened to was the story on how they met, how they proposed, or how he proposed, um, you know, their romantic story. Why? Because that gave, that gave them the sense of, oh, so, you know, like a friend. So I'm telling you my story, and, uh, and I met him in, I don't know, university, etc. But that was the first question I always made. So how did you two meet? Tell me. And they would go, say, Ivan como lo media. And then we would go, you know, into business. But once I got into business, they already felt comfortable with me, for example. And uh, they kind of, I kind of formed a relationship with them. And at the end of the, of the appointment, I would always turn back to the story. Siempre me regresaba la historia. Just so that it doesn't feel like it's a business meeting. It feels like we are friends talking, but you're going to pay me. But we are friends talking. And that always worked. Siempre, siempre funcionaba. Most of the time, probably 90% of the time, it worked. All the time. So obviously, believe me, my first uh, appointment, it was not like that. I had to, to have more and more and more appointments until I finally decided on what style. Also, something that worked for me because I had to present a presentation, you know, on the iPad. I, I used to have an iPad for that. Um, I would put the presentation in order according to what I said, because what I find extremely annoying is that people are trying to sell things and they're going like, okay, so wait, uh, I'm going to show you. No, yes, uh, uh, just give me one second. I'm going to look for it. So as I was speaking, I would put, you know, photographs or things in order and I was speaking and I was just showing them. And I didn't even know, I mean, I didn't even have to watch the iPad. I knew that as I was speaking, the next slide or the next photograph, it was the topic that I was, I was talking because before, you know, through different appointments, I had noticed what I was going to tell them and that I needed to show them something. So that was my order. And that made me look organized. That made me look like I knew what I was telling them. That made me, that made me look like I, 100%, I was 100% sure of what we were talking about. Okay, And maybe I was, but they don't really know that, for example. So those are like little things that I made, but out of practice. It wasn't since the first appointment, believe me. For the first two months, I think I didn't sell a thing. And then I was like, okay, so I get the hang of it. I can do this and that, and I cannot do this, for example. Okay, And those are like little strategies that you can learn. They're not spontaneous, no es magia. No, you learn them. Those are little things, obviously, about your trade, según su oficio. Any questions, any doubts, any comments? Uh, I have a comment, teacher. Well, uh, do you think that it that exists a, a pattern, a pattern that most of people have? Uh, oh, well, you say that it depends on the, the context, no? But do you think that maybe really exist a pattern uh, or or you just uh, move through the situations you know yeah well my main question is do you consider that exists a pattern in among all uh, clients no customers customers mm, like a pattern I don't think, I think everyone wants to um, bargain, at least here in Mexico, a lot of people bargain, but at different um, measures. But patterns, no, I don't think there is a, like a specific pattern. I haven't encountered a pattern. I no. don't remember. Okay, uh, yeah, it's just as you say that, 
you um, that you learn that strategy uh, that that you uh, lets you that is strategy that lets you to know how to deal with a customer and using uh, the that it's it's experience no for example you say that in your first uh, meeting for example when you deal when you treat with a customer when about weddings uh, you you didn't be the same uh, like you be after okay no for the misma al principio you didn't be the same at first when you Sí, no, bueno, no fue yeah. lo mismo la primera vez, the first time, mm -hmm. like the, I don't know, no? in, in the future, you, you didn't send, you didn't being the same, so for for that reason, it was my question, if you consider that maybe exists yes. a pattern or, or, it's just, or it's just more uh, the way that you Ah, ¿cómo se dice en inglés? That you, it's an, it's an, it's an skill that you uh, reach. It's an skill that you, uh, that you get. That you get, yeah, yeah. That you get when you uh, deal when well, deal treat. I don't know what is the correct word in this case. Deal or treat. Deal deal when you have a lot of customers uh, so for that was my question teacher if you consider that that there is a pattern or it's different with all customers because as you well that did you say as you say uh, we are in a in a, a mexican culture no so maybe or for example i don't know about your work uh, but i try to i i guess that it's from city mex mexico city and maybe we have different maybe we have uh we have customs no and beliefs and so that so for that reason i try to to guess if if all customers maybe if they are from mexico city mexico city have a a pattern maybe in I, I know that all of us have different ideas and, and thoughts false, but but maybe a little, a little, a little, uh, how can I say similitude? Uh, similarities. Similarities. Yeah. Yeah. Do you consider that teacher? I think it depends on what sector you live, you, live, you work with. For example, in my particular case, a pattern that I noticed in that case, for example, in weddings, people love to talk about themselves. They do, especially their story. They just love them. And that always, always, always happened. That didn't fail. But that's because it was weddings. If you're going to have a negotiation, I don't know, with the... Uh, I don't know, teachers, it's not going to be the same. They're not going to talk, you know, about their story with their partners or their boyfriends, girlfriends, it doesn't matter. But I think that depends on the type of, you know, sector that you're working with. You would have to, or I mean, each person has to kind of figure that one out. What's the thing that it keeps popping up or what's the thing that uh, works in each in each uh, meeting, in each appointment, in each neg negotiation, for example. Mm -hmm. Comments over there? Maybe, okay, uh, maybe a, a pattern that my partner wants to follow is like uh, make comfortable the person with your negotiations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in your case, uh, talking about weddings, weddings uh, you, you Used to to make feel like uh, like close friends, and that gives you a uh, advantage. Yeah, that did give me advantage. Yeah, and maybe we should all look for that. I mean, it's not 
pleasure, it's business. But at the end, a negotiation doesn't have to be aggressive. It doesn't have to be, you know, oh God, why? No, it should be fun at the end. But I mean, there you would, each person would have to kind of assess the context, the person as well. They're very uh, serious people that they do not like to joke, for example. So, you know, better dial it down a little bit. You know, there are many, many factors over there. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Any other doubt? Any other comment? Okay, very well. All right, so um, let us go to right, this one. We were talking about the network level. Uh, something that we just missed uh, was the uniplex, uniplex relationship or relation. This means uh, individuals may interact low, solely on the basis of a work role, which means they only interact at work, for example, or they interact at work. Uh, in your personal life, for example, you have extended ki uh, kinship types. A kin is una familia. Es, eh, es cosas, pero así se dice, kinship, okay? Kinship types, you mean, you, you know them outside of work, you know them outside of negotiation. That's a multiplex relation, okay? So, obviously, you would have to check what type of relations you have with the third party or with the counterparty, okay? For example, if two individuals are related through uniplex roles, and are not connected through their relations to other individual, it is much easier to exit the relationship. You can be aggressive in the negotiation. You're not going to see the person again. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, trust in this structure of social network is also largely based on an instrumental calculus of cost and benefits, obviously, and not an emotional and personal connection. It's business, not pleasure. Okay. Now, for uh, international negotiations, which this is what we're going to do for our forum, we're going to uh, look at the parts of what affects negotiation in terms of culture all around the world, obviously. And I'm going to give you some tips that I found for negotiation, and then you can do your forum, okay? Now, in the international arena, negotiation has gained strength in recent years due to the opening of the borders when sing signing commercial treaties between countries. To be successful in personal relationships in other nations, international entrepreneurs must study culture. Knowledge is key to everything. Now, what are you going to do with your forum? Okay. The concept of culture is so big, is so broad, that ethnologist and ethnologist is a cultural anthropologist need to break it down into topics to facilitate their study. The views of the experts on the components of culture vary considerably. But the following list is representative of the way you think. What are you going to do? Well, we have these seven components of culture. We have aesthetics, what is pretty for you might not be the same thing of what is pretty for me. What is ugly for you might not be the same thing of what is ugly for me. Attitudes and beliefs. Mm -hmm. When I am stressed, I cry. Maybe you not. Okay. Religion. I don't believe in religion or I do believe in religion. Maybe you do. Maybe you are, you are a strong a religious person. Maybe you are meh, kind of a religious person. Maybe you're not religious at all, for example. It is not the same thing as uh, a Mexican Catholic as a Protestant, an English Protestant, for example. Okay. Uh, materialistic culture. We are very attached to things. Yes, we do. We are very materialistic. What happens, for example, on the other part of the world? Education. Okay. 
we go to university, we come back home. Europeans go to university and they don't see their parents for six months, for example. OK, language. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, yes, I can speak English, for example, but maybe I don't really know Chinese. Or um, what in Spain means a word, maybe here in Mexico doesn't mean the same thing. That's also language. And social organization. Here, for example, we have respect for elderly people, but oh boy, Asians, my God, you cannot touch you cannot say anything about elderly people because they are at the top for example okay so what you're going to do is uh you're going to give me examples of how this it could be one example for each on how this affects negotiation i just gave you you know very simple examples so try to think about this OK, something of aesthetics that could affect negotiation, something from attitude, from religion, materialistic culture, education, language, social organization. OK, so one example for each is going to be open in our forum. I will open it up for you. It was open, but I think it closed. And before you go into the forum, I just want to give you the tips for negotiating. This is from uh, written by Masterclass staff. It's a website. Oh, I forgot the, the link, but I'm going to give you the link. I will put it here in the PDF. So these are just for you to know. I found some tips. Uh, the first one is to make the first offer. Uh, remember that this is framing an issue. We saw it last class. Well, and anchoring as well. OK, one of the best negotiation strategies is to seize control of the bargaining table. The best negotiators do this by setting the initial terms of a negotiation. If they're selling an item, they set a high value, obviously, and leave it to the other person to propose a lower price. Never give your price because then you will receive low, you know, a lower price. Research has shown that final prices tend to be higher when the seller sets the opening offer and prices tend to be lower when the buyer offers first. Whoever speaks first sets the term of debate and can thus steer the discussion toward their underlying interest. So take advantage of this by making the first offer. Do not let the other person make the first offer. If you are very well aware of how, how much you want to gain, then give a higher price, for example, in this case, if you're selling something, give a higher price and then go from there so that you can have a little bit more of what you actually wanted in the first place. OK, if they tell you, OK, so I'm going to give you this. Oh, uh, no, you really kind of put it up. It's a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. Questions over there? I heard something. Yes, teacher, it's not all clear to me what's the meaning of aesthetic of, in this context. Of what? Aesthetic. Uh, one of the... Yeah. Aesthetic is um, the image, how you can perceive things. For example, um, for Botero, fat people were beautiful or today's artist, skinny people are beautiful. So that's aesthetics, aesthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I understand the term. It's, the, it's like the, I don't know in which country, but it's, I know that it's in Asia that the girls who have, hey, I don't know how to say chuecos, the, the tooth, the chuecos are. Uh, crooked teeth. Crooked teeth. Crooked. 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 Crooked teeth are beautiful, no? Mm -hmm. That's, that is aesthetic? Yeah. Obviously, try to take it a little bit into negotiation. Okay, okay. Ah, okay, as the, as the way that you wear and that things, no? Mm -hmm. the, 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 yeah, the, the clothes that you use, that you wear, sorry. Exactly. Okay example that is good 
the clothes is a very good example of aesthetics. OK, sure, thanks. Yep, you're welcome. Now, another tip when discussing money, use concrete numbers instead of a range. Be concrete. If you're selling a piece of jewelry and you tell the buyer that you're looking to get between 500 and 750 for it, you're likely going to get the lower price, obviously. This is because you've just told the skill negotiator opposite you how low they can go in their final offer. The other person is not going to go higher than 500 because if you accept 500, that's it. They will tell you 500. Don't yield the upper hand so quickly. No den a torcer su mano. Eso es yield the hand. You may know in your head that you'd accept 500 as a possible outcome, but there's no need to say that from the outset. Don't be afraid to say the price is 750, and if the other person wants to pay less, they'll say as much. Mm -hmm. Always toy with the price. Be the one who toys with the price. Sean los que puedan jugar con el precio. Don't let the other person do that. Only talk as much as you need to. Uh, one of the shrewdest negotiation strategy, shrewdest is a, um, como la cara de bocar, como bajita la mano. One of the shrewdest negotiation strategy is to harness the power of silence. In real life, silence can throw people off. <laughs> it's their game and affect their decision making. If you maintain eye contact but don't speak, your counterpart might start rambling and make concessions that they wouldn't otherwise. Aguantar miradas es bueno. Yeah, sometimes that helps. An effective negotiator will seize on these moments and perhaps make a counter offer that enhances their own bottom line. Maintaining silence provides an excellent window into the other's party point of view. El silencio también les da tiempo para pensar. Son como los feelers. Nos da tiempo para pensar, mm, mm, tal vez, mm, y se aceptó esto. Okay. Always use your poker face. Utilicen su cara de poker. Yes. Don't let the other person know. Um, ask open-ended questions and listen carefully. When you're trying to get your way, it rarely pays to ask a simple yes or no question. Get as much information as you can. Please do that. Yes, tongue can be dangerous. Yes, it definitely is. Be quiet sometimes. Um, to make a back and forth dialogue work for you, ask open ended question. Open ended question means that the person is going to answer with concrete responses. They're going to explain. Don't ask yes or no questions because they're vague. Son vagas las respuestas. Yes or no. So are you OK? Yes. Do you agree? No. But why? OK. Um, for instance, if you're mulling a new job offer, mulling is a pensar en reflexionar, masticar. Mm -hmm. If you're mulling a new job offer, but don't like the initial terms offered, don't ask a binary question like, is this your final offer? Ask something ended, open-ended like, what would you say if I told you I simply couldn't make this salary work for me? This course of action puts pressure on the person trying to hire you. Perhaps they'll follow up with a higher salary offer, or perhaps they'll throw in additional perks to help find common ground. If their goal is getting to yes, they'll increase their offer. And if the offer doesn't increase, you must accept that you did the best that you could. So try open-ended questions. Don't ask yes or no questions. They're never good. They're random and they're vague. Mm -hmm. And if the other person is anything like my sister, you ask three questions and she answers yes. To what? I don't know. So don't ask yes or no questions. Remember, the best negotiated agreement lets both sides win. It's always win-win. Let's be nice to people. We need people to survive. Deal makers who have a win-lose mindset tend to alienate partners. Alienate is a separar. Hacer un lado o dejar solo. Mm -hmm. Uh, alineación, alineación, es como el parental, pero no me acuerdo la palabra en español. To alienate partners and kill the chance for repeat business. But deal makers who push for win-win outcomes, where both sides get something they want, can open a lot of doors. That is true. If you approach everything like a scramble for a fixed pie of benefits, you can slip into cutthroat behavior that could damage your, your professional reputation. If you are super aggressive, 
they are not going to want to make business with you again. I can assure you. You can be as as good as you wish, but if you're cutthroat, si se van a la yugular, if you're cutthroat, they will be like, oh God, him, her, no, for example, okay? For sustained success running a corporation, a small business, or your own personal portfolio, try to be partners with people with whom you negotiate. Attune your listening skills, listen, listen, and watch their body languages. As I told you, look how they how they um, behave. If they have cross arms, they're not so happy, for example. And above all, stay honest. Don't be the kind of person who sells damaged goods or cheats someone's out of money that is rightfully theirs. Never promise things you cannot fulfill. Do not, never, never promise something that you cannot fulfill because you get into a lot of trouble. Be careful with that. Mm, use a business deal ethically and with a win-win mentality. You will, you will have fruitful relationships, that is true. And these are just some tips written by Masterclass staff. Okay, so just some little things that you should take into consideration for your good negotiation. Now, uh, we're a little bit late on the time, so don't worry. We're going to leave the forum for homework. Remember, one example, try to uh, steer it Traten de eh, dirigirlo, try to steer it into negotiation, okay? I know it's a little bit difficult with so many examples here, but try to steer it a little bit into negotiation, okay? Each one of them, one example, please. Now, the forum is going to be open until next week. You already have the chain. Uh, I'm going to show you this very, very quickly. So, the chain, please... I'm going to share with you so that you can see it. Where am I? Here. Please, so you're going to click on the forum. This is the, the forum. I'm going to change it. Components of culture. And please click on start. Okay. And answer here. Responder. So that you, we can see it as a chain. Okay. Questions or doubts about the forum? No, teacher. Okay. Any questions, any doubts about the topics in today? This is our last class of negotiation, so. All clear, teacher. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Well, then uh, that will be all for today. Thank you very much for coming. Next class, we will start with financial terms. So try to read something about financial economy so that we can see. Okay. Teacher, yeah. teacher. Well, I I have two questions, but it's not about the topic. Uh, if not about the the, the uh, a signature. Uh, the first is, do do you know if the exam, the test, will be the next week or the week past? The week after. Uh, I think we have two weeks until the exam. Uh, okay, okay, two weeks. Okay, and and the other it's it's more about me that if you can add me into into Teams group because I can send you message in this. I can I can see the chat and write it in, on the chat. So I don't know if you can. Pass me the code or I pass you the. Yeah, just let me ask because I didn't make the group. So I don't know if I can add you, but I will let you know either way. Don't worry. Okay, teacher. Thanks. And that's all. So have a nice day, teacher, and see you. you. Have a nice day, everyone. Yes, I will upload the slides. I have class in a few minutes, but I will upload the slides uh, in the afternoon. Don't worry. Okay. Thank you very much. You're free to go. Thank you, teacher. See you. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice week as well. Thank you. Thank you. See you next Tuesday. Thank you.